start this, uh, this afternoon's program from the remarks from the ambassador who is with us this afternoon and uh, would like to say a few words of welcome to you. So thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Dan, for that remarks. Uh, distinguished participants, resource persons, uh, it gives us great pleasure to extend a very warm welcome to all of you uh, to the permanent mission of Sri Lanka. Uh, and we have the privilege of hosting this today on this important topic of international post-disaster recovery and relief why social work matter in collaboration with the Global Social Issues uh, Council of the Council on Social Work Education, CSWE. It is encouraging to observe that today's forum has brought together leading policy experts on natural disasters, uh, disaster management, social work educators and practitioners who specialize in disaster planning, management and relief, as well as social work students and faculty from the social work programs in the tri-state area. Natural as well as, well as man-made disasters pose grave challenges to the advancement of humankind. United Nations Secretary General's latest report on the implementation of the Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction observes that disasters exact an enormous toll on economic development of nations, conservatively estimated at between 250 and 300 billion US dollars annually. The impact is particularly harsh on developing states. We in Sri Lanka understood this reality very clearly in stark terms when the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami devastated our coastal communities along with those of many of the other countries in the region. Recent floods and landslides in Sri Lanka earlier this year due to intense rainfall on an unprecedented scale affected over 300,000 people in Sri Lanka. However, it is encouraging to note that a global response to disasters is emerging in the context of the United Nations, particularly in the field of disaster risk reduction. The Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction adopted last, year's, uh, adopted last year is testimony to that global response. It is well established that the affected state has a primary uh, role and responsibility in providing uh, disaster relief assistance. They are best placed to determine priorities and to decide on coordination. We must, at the same time, realize that the, the, the fundamental value of solidarity in international relations and cooperation in providing disaster relief to persons affected to augment those efforts being taken by the affected state. It is also imperative that our action must, in a holistic manner, cover all stages of the disaster cycle. As Secretary General Ban Ki-moon recently observed in his message, on International Day for Disaster Reduction, and I quote, on this International Day for Disaster Reduction, I call on all governments to work with civil society and the private sector to move from managing disasters to managing risk. Let us move from a culture of reaction to one of prevention and build resilience by reducing loss of life, unquote. In addressing climate change, the major root cause for disasters, a major milestone was reached when states mustered the requisite political will to reach a legally binding universal climate agreement in Paris in December. And I'm extremely pleased to note that the Paris Climate Change Agreement will enter into force next Friday. So we are meeting at an uh, auspicious time. At national level too, states have developed their own strategies to mitigate the risk of disasters 
and to better manage them when they occur. For example, in Sri Lanka, the five-year Sri Lanka Comprehensive Disaster Management Program, SLCDMP of 2014 to 2018, follows a multi-sector, multi-agency approach for disaster management. Today's forum focuses its attention on a dimension that we in the United Nations do not contemplate that often, the role of the social worker in the post-disaster recovery, uh, recovery and relief. Social workers have long been involved with disaster management and post-disaster recovery and relief. Their unique knowledge and skills in rebuilding communities and societies after disasters have been quite useful. The wide range of roles that a social worker can play in disaster relief and recovery is a matter that merits an in-depth discussion. A forum of this nature would provide us with that opportunity. The discussions here would assist us to understand why the social work matters in post-disaster scenarios, in saving lives, alleviating the suffering and rebuilding affected communities. I wish to thank uh, Professor Dishana Jayasundar, Department of Social Work, University of North Dakota, and Chair of the Council on Global Social Issues, who first raised this uh, matter with us and made this proposal, which we are very glad to accept. It's unfortunate that she could not be with us today because she had rushed to Sri Lanka for personal reasons. And of course, Mr. Dan Hester, uh, of School of Social Work, University of Southern California, for coordinating the arrangements uh, for this meeting. I mean, I also add that I had requested one of my close colleagues uh, Mr. Eduardo Valencia Ospina, who is the Special Rapporteur of the International Law Commission. And uh, when this topic of protection of persons in the event of disasters, we both served in the Commission together, and I told him he happens to be in New York, if it's possible at some point to drop by today to be with us, and the presence of Special Rapporteur uh, on this topic certainly will be most beneficial. And finally, uh, I wish to Excuse myself shortly after the statement. I'm sorry because we have a very, very tight schedule these days in the United Nations. Liberty Ambassador Mr. Khan will be present throughout these uh, discussions. So finally, I wish this forum a very fruitful uh, deliberations uh, today. Thank, thank you very much. Let me introduce the first uh, uh, speaker for today's disaster forum, Ms. Madhavi Madalgoda Aribantu, who will speak on gender and women's issues in the aftermath of the 2004 tsunami in Sri Lanka. Ms. Aribantu is attached to the United Nations Office for Disaster Risk Reduction as the sub regional coordinator for Central Asia and South Caucasus, and also serves as the gender focal point for Asia Pacific. Ms. Arya Bantu is a development professional with over 25 years of experience with special interest on the political economy of development and disasters. She has authored and co-authored several publications in varying aspects of disasters and most notably on gender and women's issues. She is the recipient of the prestigious Mehdi Frank Myers Award for advancing women's careers in emergency management and for promoting gender disaster research awarded by the Gender and Disaster Network and the Natural Hazard Center at the University of Colorado. Since she's unable to be here in person today because of prior committed duties, she will be sharing with us her recorded video speech, and it's going to be 20 minutes, and then we have uh, 10 minutes uh, for uh, comments or uh, questions from the audience. Please take a listen. Distinguished participants, good afternoon to all of you. I'm extremely pleased to connect with you today to share experience from the 2004 uh, Indian Ocean tsunami aftermath in Sri Lanka. Uh, first of all, I would like to commend the organizers, organizers for arranging 
this seminar on this very important topic. Uh, I congratulate and I thank the organizers, the, global, uh, the Council on Global Social Issues and the Permanent Mission of Sri Lanka in New York. I'm honored to have the opportunity to join the event today. Please accept my apologies for my inability to be with you in person. Let me start by providing some background. 2004 Indian Ocean Tsunami was an unknown, unexpected happening for Sri Lanka. Up to this catastrophic event, tsunami was not a hazard listed in the hazard profile of the country. The management and the institutional systems at the time, therefore, were not ready for the scale of the impact of the 2004 tsunami. To get an idea of the scale, in Sri Lanka, the tsunami resulted in over 31,000 of deaths, more than 15,000 injuries, and thousands missing across 13 districts in five provinces. 193,000 houses were fully or partially damaged, and around 160,000 families were displaced. So this accounted for 13 of the 25 administrative districts of the country, and nearly 60% of the coastline of the country were affected. Soon after this catastrophic outcome, there has been a large influx of international, foreign, and local aid organizations, donors, non-governmental organizations, and private sector initiatives. This is in addition to the government efforts. I would like to say that the aftermath of December 2004 tsunami showcased the prevailing gender-based disparities in Sri Lanka. The insensitivity towards and ignorance of some of the vital gender considerations, both practical needs and strategic interests and considerations were apparent in the emergency response, in recovery, and in the rehabilitation plan. In the next few weeks, I would elaborate on a uh, little bit in detail uh, on those aspects. Uh, first of all, there was a clear lack of awareness on gender and women's issues amongst all actors who were active in the relief and recovery work. The issues that were highlighted include gender insensitive emergency and relief management and recovery, absence of women in relief, recovery planning and management, which impacted and uh, which in fact implicated and impacted on both women and men. Let's take a look at the status prior to the tsunami in terms of gender issues. This will help us to give us the perspective on the tsunami aftermath. In Sri Lanka, there are persistent gender disparities noted in social, economic and political spheres. Sri Lanka shows impressive social indicators. For example, with the rate of literacy in the range of 90% for women and 92% for men, Sri Lanka is ranked as one of the most literate countries in South Asian subcontinent. In the Global Gender Equality Index of year 2013, Sri Lanka ranks midway at number 75 out of 149 countries. Despite such impressive social indicators, women are less represented in leadership, management, and decision-making positions at the formal and public levels. Uh, the low representation, this kind of low representation at the formal levels, is largely due to prevailing social perceptions and attitudes and accepted norms which associate women's role within the home and family. These attitudes were clearly reflected in the emergency and recovery phases, including poor recognition and inclusion of women's skills and capabilities, deployment of women in unskilled manual work, and little attention paid to women's livelihood options in the recovery plan. It was clear that despite a national policy discourse on gender, there is a clear lack of awareness of gender issues among government officials at all levels. I would like to share with you related observations in the aftermath of tsunami in four main areas. Emergency management, 
security and safety, women's participation and representation, and in recovery planning. Let's begin with the emergency management. Practical needs of women were largely overlooked in responding to the immediate crisis situation. I could list a few dis distinct areas in terms of security and safety, sanitary needs, and pregnancy-related practical logistical aspects and health considerations. There were issues in accessing relief goods, access to information on, uh, in general, and on relief options. Uh, uh, there are international minimum standards in humanitarian response already worked out and documented, which are called sphere standards. These standards focus on consideration of quality and accountability of humanitarian response, uh, which are uh, applied, which, which are agreed to apply all over the world. Now, these uh, humanitarian standards, unfortunately, unfortunately, were not adhered to adequately in the post-tsunami situation in Sri Lanka. It was also observed the multiple roles of women. Uh, they intensified during displacement. In relief camps, women and girls were often seen uh, taking responsibility for dependents and the needy, taking care of the families, children, and the elderly. As in normal circumstances, it was their job to secure firewood, ensure meals for all the family members, and take on the uh, responsibility of overall well-being of the family. Uh, women had to specifically ensure the safety of children in unknown and volatile environments in their displacement. Uh, another important fact about the emergency management, a large majority of the camps were nearly 250,000 uh, 250, of the displaced lived were managed almost entirely by teams of men. Women in the management teams were a rare case. This impacted both on the awareness of and sensitivity towards women's needs and concerns, particularly within the cultural context of Sri Lanka. There were reports on inappropriate or insensitive activities in the, uh, in the camps, such as gender insensitive, insensitive relief distribution, culturally insensitive and inappropriate ways of uh, relating to people, relief food distribution, as well as psychosocial approaches to counsel. Uh, let's move on to the security and safety aspects. It was observed that women affected by the tsunami to be at greater risk for sexual violence, both within and outside the camps. Uh, gender insensitive arrangements in allocating toilet and bathing areas in temporary camps and shelter. They were not, uh, uh, which were noted to be common practice, and they were not, uh, they were actually conducive for women and girls to uh, face the incidence of harassment. Media reporting indicated incidents of rape, sexual abuse, and sexual harassment in toilet and bathing areas. When it comes to domestic violence, it was also uh, observed that women's increased vulnerability to domestic violence persisted beyond the initial emergency phase across the affected areas, as reported uh, in the district-wide post-tsunami assessment conducted by the United Nations agencies and the development banks in Sri Lanka. Lack of privacy was a considerable issue. Privacy-related issues also led to condi conditions conducive to sexual abuse, harassment, and violence. Uh, in terms of reproductive and sexual health care needs in the camps, it was noted the awareness was inadequate, as well as women in a number of camps in southern and eastern provinces said that it was difficult to access both advice on such matters, as well as accessing contraceptives. Men from a number of camps admitted to increasing their alcohol consumption, the, uh, which was attributed to trauma and stress resulting from the disaster, as well as having access to cash through various relief schemes which were introduced soon after the disaster. Um, women's, uh, let's, let's look at uh, what was the level of representation and participation in, in women in post-tsunami. 
there was a noticeable gap in women's participation in all stages of tsunami recovery. The, this gap was uh, noted both with affected people and with external relief and recovery teams. There were a number of special committees established for planning and implementing recovery efforts. This included damage assessment teams that operated during the early months after the tsunami, non-governmental organizations and donor consortiums, and district review boards. In addition, there were planning meetings and forums set up by civil society groups. In the camps and temporary shelters, there were camp management teams. It was noted, however, that women's participation at all different levels of recovery planning and management remained at a very low level. Some of the noted efforts to engage women uh, and address women's concerns came from the non-governmental organizations, both local and international. However, such efforts remained largely isolated and they were insufficient given the scale and the magnitude of the situation. Uh, now, a bit about recovery planning. Here, I would like to begin with the issue of information and data. In collecting and collating data and information for recovery planning, there was a general failure to recognize the many diverse groups. So this is broader than the gender and women, women's issue. It was also strongly observed that the absence of gender disaggregated data and the fact that no serious attempts were made to collect them was quite noticeable. For example, none of the initial post-tsunami national and sector-based assessments conducted in Sri Lanka included the gender analysis. Similarly, the medium and long-term livelihood recovery and other aspects of recovery were planned without sufficient gender disaggregated data and without gender analysis at the individual, community, and national level, which uh, we, we could um, observe and note and conclude now in the aftermath which was a, quite a serious gap. Um, it's worth noting, however, that although major players in the recovery process pledged gender sensitivity and have taken some specific measures, uh, for example, the task force for rebuilding the nation, TAFRAN in short, appointed a special committee on gender and established a women's division at the Human Rights Commission at the TAFRAN Disaster Relief Monitoring Unit. However, operationalizing such efforts faced severe constraints. Also, there was the spending pressure from the donors, which was quite high, and when there is uh, such pressure for deliver quickly, uh, it is a gender consideration which were easily compromised. In the face of pressure for spending and quick delivery, gender analysis and gender-based planning often was considered as additional work and a burden and were often compromised. Uh, let me share with you a clear example that was noted in the housing recovery program. In another district, also in the southern province, kitchen space inside the house was built without any windows or vents to release smoke from cooking with fire. Uh, for a large majority of people in Sri Lanka, still the cooking modality is actually with use of firewood, which actually, in this case, without vents to release uh, firewood smoke, can lead to serious health considerations. So in summary, uh, let me share with you the key concerns. Low representation of women in the relief, recovery planning, and in implementation. Lack of gender awareness and sensitivity in damage and need assessment and in the program plan. Planning by most actors who were actively working in the field, complete absence of displaced and affected persons, in particular women, in all aspects of planning, implementing and monitoring in the emergency and transitional phase. For example, women have not been consulted on camp organization, which often resulted in their needs and concerns not getting adequately addressed. Uh, very importantly, displaced women mention a severe lack of avenues for e expressing any of their concerns during the various stages of relief and recovery plan. Discussions and meetings held by officials and other visitors were conducted with predominantly male attendants, the representatives in the, in the camps. Further, women were not 
adequately consulted in camp management, relocation decisions, or in design of reconstructing houses. Even though, practically, in daily life, their knowledge and experience make their ideas very often need-based and practical. So in consideration of this kind of uh, outcome, uh, the recovery outcomes were unlikely to yield equitable benefits, and it was inevitable that gender-based disparities to persist with, uh, within the approaches taken. Um, Post-tsunami recovery and reconstruction, when nearly half the areas and significant share of the population in the country was affected, was an opportunity to make some fundamental changes, like for addressing the pre-existing social, economic, and gender-based and related structural issues. This opportunity, however, unfortunately was not given its due. The short video you will watch in a while has captured these issues and has proposed some fundamental measures to how to address them in emergency management, relief, recovery, rebuilding, and reconstruction. You look at uh, any post-disaster situation reported worldwide, you will repeatedly come across the same issues when it comes to women and gender concerns. Uh, now please allow me to reflect on looking towards the future. Uh, I'm sure you all are aware that year 2015 was a globally significant year when the global community agreed on three major uh, global agendas, 2030 Agenda for Resilience. So I would uh, take a few minutes to look into a possible windows and opportunities for us to address the concerns which this seminar is discussing today. Uh, the three major global agreements which came into place in 2015 are Sustainable Development Goals, Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, and the Paris Agreement for Climate Change. They are all till the year 2030, and they all agree on the need for coherent action at all levels in realizing the desired outcomes by year 2030. 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, with its 17 Sustainable Development Goals, aspires to ensure prosperity and well-being for all people. There are, in the sustainable de development goals, there are more than 100 targets. Out of that, there are 25 targets related to disaster risk reduction, uh, corresponding with 10 out of the 17 sustainable development goals. They firmly establish the role of disaster risk reduction as a core development strategy. In short, if we if we are committed to achieve sustainable development goals by 2030, disaster risk reduction is an absolutely imperative condition for us to work towards. A few words about the dedicated framework for disaster risk reduction. The Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, 2015-2030, underlines that women's participation is critical to effectively managing disaster risk and building overall resilience and sustainable development and strongly recommend and call for resourcing and implementing gender-sensitive disaster risk reduction policies, plans, and programs to empower women for preparedness as well as for post-disaster situations. In conclusion, I would like to say it is important that we all respond to this call and take responsibility on ourselves to meet the many challenges in reaching the goal in front of us. Thank you very much for your attention, and I wish successful deliberation for the rest of the discussions. Uh, moving on to the next speaker. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome our uh, speaker for uh, today's uh, disaster forum, Dr. Golam Mabbor, who will be presenting on community social work approaches in rebuilding lives post-disaster. Dr. Mabbor is a graduate of Harvard University's Management Development Program. Dr. Mabbor, who is a professor in the School of Social Work at Manmat University, served as the Associate Dean of the School of Humanities and Social Sciences from 2006 to 2015, 
as well as the founding and two-term chair of the Department of Philosophy, Religion, and Interdisciplinary Studies at Monmouth University. In addition, Dr. Matt Board served as a member of the Global Social Work Education Commission of the U.S. Council on Social Work Education from July 2004 to June 2010. In 2007, he was awarded the Outstanding Leadership Award by the Global Understanding Project at Monmouth University. During his decades-long career, Dr. Mapbor has published extensively on disaster relief, community preparedness, social development, and international social work education. Has visited 54 countries, and most of them are on official assignments, and has taught in Europe, Asia, and North America. Currently, he is serving as president of the American Institute of Bangladesh Studies and also serving as a member of the board of directors of the Council of American Overseas Research Centers. Professor Mapbor, a Bangladeshi American, was born and brought up in Kutubdia Island of Cox's Bazar district in Bangladesh. He has conducted field research projects on disaster relief and management issues in Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Indonesia, and Maldives. His theories on social capital, community participation for disaster preparedness, and mitigating the consequences of disasters are recognized internationally and being used widely. With that, I ask that you give your full attention to Dr. Mathbor and help me in welcoming him to the podium. Dr. Mathbor. Good afternoon, Honorable Ambassador, Sri Lankan Permanent Mission to the United Nations, Dr. Pereira, Deputy Ambassador, Distinguished Diplomats, STEAM faculty member, dear as a student and guest. And this is the first time that both my wife and my daughter are also here with me for this presentation. I've been speaking about disaster management for the last 30 years, uh, meaning that I'm not that old, but I've been working on this for 30 years. I must say that even more than that, I was born and brought up in a cyclone-prone area of Bangladesh, a very remotest island, Kutubdi Island. I was born and brought up there. Then I left the island for higher education. So I am going to draw upon my insights, experience, based on my expertise, you know, the lived experiences in the cyclone-prone area, as well as my decades-long precious experiences in disaster relief and management. If you look at my publications and my research and credential, this is an area is very dear and closest to my heart. And always, I've been doing my research in the coastal regions of Bangladesh. You cannot talk about coastal regions without talking about disaster. That's the first hit, as we all know that. 
So for this presentation, for 30 minutes, I believe, uh, right? 35 minutes, that's very good. Initially, I thought 25 minutes. It's so difficult to talk about the experience of 30 years in 25 minutes. So, which is good now, 35, right? So one minute for one year. Um, and still, my entire family is living in that island, other than my personal family, we live in New Jersey. And I would like to also thank the person who put together, who really initiated this event, Dishana Jaya Sundara. He's a long time friend and a colleague. In fact, I served on our dissertation committee as an external member. When I first went to McGill University, Montreal, to do my second master's, and in fact, my professor would not understand what this has to do with social work. Now you see how social work response matters, and it is an integral. I think I'm going to talk about that when I elaborate on my presentation. So this is the definition, and in fact, also I want to uh, command, you know, the Sri Lankan permanent mission to take an initiative to talk about, you know, the, uh, to put together this event. And in fact, you know, I have been to Sri Lanka twice. First, to participate in the second international conference on disaster management. That was organized by MIND, Munasinghe Institute for Development, Professor Mohan Munasinghe, who was the vice president of IPCC and won the Nobel Peace Prize with Al Gore. And this is the definition coming from that second international conference on disaster management. And in fact, then he invited me to work with him as a senior research fellow of Mona Singh Institute for Development. So I had been there for then six weeks, but I could not go right after 2004. I went there in 2006. And from there, I also worked in Indonesia as well as Maldives. So twice I have been to that beautiful, beautiful country. As someone mentioned that, I think the first speaker, the most literate country in South Asia, and most humble, beautiful, amazing people in that country. I have many friends in that country. I worked with the civil servant. I also worked with UNDP there. And also, I worked with all those universities there. So the definition, when we talk about disaster, it's all about hazards. So it is a hazard that almost causes significant damage to properties, most importantly, the casualties. And we know when we talk about disaster, there are three kinds of disasters. So natural disasters, then accidental disaster, then some people say human-made disaster, some people say human-induced disaster, some people say man-made disaster. If you want to become more gender-friendly, I think we, I like the word human-made instead of man-made disasters. This are the picture I'm going to run very quickly just to put the things into context. You know, each of these pictures is asking for a service, not only from social worker, but social worker, how we can be more instrumental and more monumental in terms of providing services, you will see them. So I tried to bring all kinds of disasters here. 911, Sri Lanka, require medical treatment. Super dome shelters. Sorry. Hike and Katarina. Tsunami to the Japan earthquake. This is from Bangladesh Cyclone Theater 2007. So again, Tsunami 2011. Pakistan, then all this, like, you know, telling us that we need the kind of services. 1995, so, you know, I think I will run them very quickly so that we know how the devastation and what kind of services. These are the heroes of that champion program called Cyclone Preparedness Program of the Bangladesh Red Peace and Society. They do not care about their life, they care about their, they care about their fellow citizens' life. And even when they take disaster strike, right to it, they jump to help the fellow citizens. And I think uh, this is the dream also they organized to make an awareness of the people, 
even you know here also without a demonstration. So uh, and right, life moves on. The children we know that victim, children, women, mentally frail, elderly. We'll see that, but we need to move on. So this is like for the mental health. You know, as a social worker, we are, we know what it requires. Now this is the amazing thing from tornado damage Illinois. No matter what we talk about, you know, the, uh, the world disaster, when it is strike, disaster management is all about people. We know infrastructure damage, but still is the people that matter most. So when we talk about people, you know, you, I think someone already mentioned, our first speaker mentioned about the preparedness, recovery and reconstruction of the building. When I talk about disaster, relief and management, these are the five things that come to my mind. Definitely we need the preparedness, which I try to keep all of them in R, so readiness. The relief prognosis, as social worker we know, immediate need. Then recovery, midterm. Then reconstruction, long term. And of course, research both for assessment, diagnosis, you know, uh, evaluation, we definitely need wonderful tool to utilize in order to know what is uh, what the people need before and after. And we cannot actually use the blanket kind of program for both developed countries and developing countries because the needs are like, you know, the unique in their own ways. So we can see the differences like, you know, how the developed world and developing world just to give an example, you see, this is uh, information coming from Pamela Society, 1997. 863,000 from 1822 to 1997, you see the people that Bangladesh lost by claim by disasters. Uh, I think that like 67 major disasters took place within that time frame. And in fact, as a matter of fact, Bangladesh expect a major cyclone um, like every two years. So what are the lessons learned? You know, because as a social worker, we are trained in two areas. What are the problems? And we do not stop there. We want to address the problems. So we know that from different, this is coming from my all experiences and research project. One thing we have learned that invisible assets of the community, what are those invisible assets? I think our first speaker also mentioned about, you know, hinted towards that. So human and social capital matters. I think, of course, infrastructure is very important, but in addition to that, human and social capital are also very important. And it is before, as we discuss about that one commentator mentioned about the preparedness, you know, like right at the readiness, right before, there are three stages, before, during, and after. You cannot talk about, you know, the rebuilding without talking about preparedness or before what we need to do. And also we have learned that strong social cohesion that always accelerated and prompted the disaster relief and recovery uh, programs. Utilization of social capital also enhances the community preparedness. Also we learned that this is from Red River Flood in Canada, like the communities that are well prepared physically, psychologically, and socially, culturally, are better responders. This is not my makeup, you know, it's coming from our experiences from 1997. And this is important, you know, the comment made by NYU professor mentioned that preparedness at the local level was a real weakness. At that time, you know, when we had the Hurricane Katrina, the FEMA has, I think, 2,700 employees for the entire country, a population of 313 million United States. So they cannot rescue and they do not know where to go. Like, you know, so without involving community people, it's like, you know, the, you cannot think about, you know, the uh, recovery or readiness or preparedness or to save the population. And existing early, uh, early warning systems, you know, the warning system only warn people, alert people, in many cases are not culturally specific. Uh, again, human social capital, that. And one, another most important thing is the vulnerability. I think one of our colleagues here to mention about that, who are the most vulnerable. 
So as a social worker, we know that who are the most vulnerable. We know that mentally frail people, and we work very closely with them. Children, even in many cases, women becomes vulnerable. And you know, the, uh, so so there are the vulnerability and also vulnerability of the locality is also important that we need to assess. And we have also learned that poor are the hardest hit of any disaster. You remember 2008, World Disaster Report say that disaster do not discriminate, but we do. Because who will get what, who will be rescued, we determine that, like you know, social education, social provision. So vulnerability meaning what? Vulnerability of physical, social, economic, and political. You know, someone talked about the women's participation. So political vulnerability, they are right from day one. And also, uh, and we know that they are the one routinely experience the worst inequities. And there is a strong link between poverty and vulnerability. Poorer people are more vulnerable. We all know that. Uh, so mortality from disaster, like we see that, you know, uh, having the poorest socioeconomic status. They are, we can see the more people die. And this is also from 1991 Bangladesh cyclone, you know, because of the lack of decent housing, you know, that could be attributable to also mortality. This is amazing, the last one. How the indigenous knowledge can play a wonderful role in terms of rescuing people. In, 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 uh, in Andaman Island, for example, during the tsunami, there's no casualties because Water, receiving water was a sign that tsunami was coming. So they all took, you know, the shelter in the higher ground. So you see how the indigenous knowledge is that important in terms of saving people. Uh, still, negligence is there. No matter how precise we are in terms of disseminating the signal and warning, still there are people always neglect. And there are people also, you know, they cannot go to the shelter because of there's no feeding road, there is no good transportation, you know, so that's another factor. And in Hurricane Katrina's case, we know that people are not evacuated one at a time. Always one thing we notice from different sites and the locations of the disaster affected areas that well coordinated chain of command is when I say well coordinated chain of command between the civil society, NGOs, government, international NGOs, you know, local self-government, you know, I think that always is very important. So, we looked at the devastation that calls for services, and then we looked at, this is not the exhaustive list, you know, because as a social worker, we pay more attention to the social aspects and the social issues than, you know, the infrastructure. Infrastructure is the engineering things, you know, so, but I think we'll need to work together. Four strategies that community social work process that I thought I was going to share with you. The first one is the CPP. Why is it so unique? And then the second one is by Professor Mohan Munasinghe, Action Impact Matrix. This is amazing for assessment of vulnerability, particularly in terms of climate change and adaptation. The last two are my two theories coming out from my research work. The third, community participation in disaster relief and management, the social capital theory, and the community, uh, and the community participation model. So what is the uniqueness of this CPP? Why is a world champion model that emanated from Bangladesh? And the volunteer that I show you, the two volunteers, absolutely volunteers. They are not paid. They are working absolutely on voluntary basis. So the uniqueness of wonderful chain of command, within two minutes, they can mobilize their volunteers locally. And they are ready. And we talked about women participation. 50% women, 50% men. This is amazing model. And it uses both personnel and impersonal communication. You know, Hurricane Katrina, we alerted people using the electronic medias. But we know that the other people, they can't go anywhere because they do not know how to go or they are not able to move. So impersonal communication is very important and that's what the uniqueness of this program. And they're trained in disaster relief and management. It's around the year. They just do not train the people just to work, you know, after the disaster. 
around the year, management training, supervision training, rescue training, first aid training. And there is a wonderful line of authority and well-informed leadership. And above all, the government, government continued support. That's the most important thing. We know government is not doing the thing. Let's bypass the government, go for NGO, civil society, no. It's got to be very coordinated. Government has the largest machinery. So why don't we fix it and why we don't utilize the government you know, the resources? So this is the way they, they receive the signal from NASA and it goes to Bangladesh Meteorological Department and it goes to Bangladesh Education Society and it goes to the south. Uh, south southern part of Bangladesh is the 20, about 30 million people live in this uh, Bay of Bengal coastal regions and in fact I'm from that region. So you see they use very high frequency, high frequency radio and all kinds of you know. So this is like how the signal goes from headquarter to the district, district to the sub-district, sub-district to the union, union to the ward. So how they work, the clear line of authority, this is just at the grassroots level. So they have like working group, warning group, shelter group, rescue group, first aid group, relief group. And both male and female equally work in this. This is an amazing, amazing model. Action impact matrix. So that's for the preparedness. This one is for the vulnerability. Vulnerability of both human being as well as vulnerability of the locality. And the unique feature of this is by Professor Mohan Mala Singh here. It helps us to determine how, and he has come up with something that we call the per capita income. You know, it's a wonderful, wonderful mathematical thing. I have participated in the second international conference of disaster management, and we came up with this wonderful formula. So it helps us to determine the vulnerability and adaptation relevant to climate change, help us to determine the impacts of climate change on vulnerability and adaptation, it helps us to identify how the government, development policy and goals impact the locality. And we know there is one going on in Bangladesh about a power plant project they are trying to put in Shandarban, the world largest mangrove forest. So identify also help uh, how vulnerability adaptation might affect policies. So this is the way, you know, I, I'm not going to go details on that, but you can see it will tell you, the less means it will give you only two disease. So you will see, you can calculate and you can expand the list, you know, based on environment, agriculture, social services, different areas, you know. So that's, that's the vulnerability. We need to assess the vulnerability both in terms of infrastructure and the people. The third thing is the social capital theory. And in fact, World Bank has mentioned about social capital, about Pudna, also mentioned about social capital. But this is a specific life developed for the disaster management, relief and management areas. It is again based on three uh, pillars of social capital, bonding, bridging, and linking. But I went one step further. So the Libby is coastal, you know, the things I put here. And if we look at the first step, this is where I think uh, I can take the credit. I went one step further than the World Bank. Social capital and activities, because people will ask, as a social worker, we always you know, think about why and how. People will, how we are going to enhance the bonding? So it's the social and human capital. And what are the activities? So on the right hand side, I put here the activities. You know, So this is for one area. Then if you look at this bridging, Say things happening in Queens, you know, about to strike something, for God's sake not, then Brooklyn need to be also included, then the Staten Island need to be included. So we need to work together. In Pakistan case, for example, what I, we have learned, 2010, Tata district was severely, you know, the great, great flood affected. And in 2011, Bodin district was seriously affected. So in Bodin district case, they learn from the other district experience. So I think, you know, we need to work together. And once you have the bonding and bridging, the next thing is linking to the institutions because you need services. Services is not going to come from where it comes from the institutions. 
So I think this is a wonderful thing that all kinds of stakeholders, all kinds of service providers need to be included. And when you have the good bonding and bridging, everyone is going to talk about the same thing. Other services go here, services go there. It's got to be like coordinated services. And that way, we can also avoid a duplication and duplication of services. The last one is about participation, participation, participation. Participation of all the schools, 50% of the population. And someone mentioned very correctly that even women provide, can be more helpful and instrumental in terms of providing services in this area. And it is not, I'm making it up, from our Pakistan project, we have published, you know, it was also sponsored by CSW, funded by the Social Science Humanization Council of Canada. We looked into six countries. In Pakistan case, that uh, I was in charge of Pakistan side, it's all about gender things. Bathrooms, domestic violence, sexual abuse, bathrooms are not like you're know, women friendly. So all kinds of things, you know, we have just published an article on the Oxfam Journal of Gender and Development. You will see that, you know, Margaret Alston, Lena Dominari, myself, and Julie uh, Dronek from Canada. So this one actually is, a, is the result of my doctoral dissertation. Two of my master's theses are based on the disaster issues and my doctoral dissertation, which is a book published by Lyceum. It got to be a horizontal relationship. Someone mentioned that it cannot be a bottom up. Cannot, sorry, it cannot be a top down. It needs to be horizontal. So uniqueness of this model, you know, we know that community participation is not a natural construction, it's a social construction. Who will participate, what they will participate, why they will participate, where they will participate is determined by us. So I also emphasize here that the dialogue need to begin from the conceptualization of whatever the disaster management project to the evaluation. And it is the model that I'm going to share with you. It includes both bottom-up and top-down. It believes that it is not an end. In most cases, we see participation is an end, but it is a process. So these are the two parties. We know that project proponent, the disaster management services and sales, and here are the community people. The, the strategy or the technique that brings both parties together is the community participation process. This process takes place in four stages as it emanated from my research. You need to inform the people, you need to educate the people, then they are the best planner. The second stage is once you have the plan, the policy in place, the next thing is about implementation. So then, of course, it will yield some kind of benefits, political, social, you know, subjective, objective benefits. It got to be equitably distributed among all the stakeholders. And of course, feedback, feedback is the key for the future. Uh, renewal and integration of the programs. And I have these techniques, you know, gender, someone talked about it, gender sensitivity is the key. And this is like, you know, in the book actually published the model in this way. Now, social work. So we talked about, you know, the issues that what we learn. These are four strategies from me. It's not exhaustive or the peace meal or only panacea, but there are many. But from my experience, this I find it very useful. So what social workers can do? Social workers, I think, are familiar with both macro, macro, and of course micro level. You know, we we are equally trained, you know, this is the uniqueness of the social workers, both mental and physical, social, psychological. So I think because of this familiarity, social workers, I think, you know, can enhance the capability of the so capability both in terms of social, political, economic, and environmental level when disasters strike. And also, considering that the social workers live and work in the communities, so they are more familiar with the people, the vulnerable people, and vulnerable area, you know, because we work with the people, we work with the people, and you know, in many cases, by the people. So that's another unique that we have. In, I have mentioned a case of Sri Lanka here. So you, social workers are familiar with all kinds of stakeholders, even you know, from uh, from the state, central, you know, to the division, to the grammar, the other levels. And we know that social workers are there as a sense of change. They are not to talk about the organization. They are there to represent the community people. 
And also, social worker can play a wonderful role in terms of psychosocial support. Uh, and also, we are well trained on asset mapping, right? Asset mapping, and also we are, we are quite familiar with people, those who are doing the private practice. And in fact, the private practice, we know how the people are connected in terms of using our genome. Uh, and, and then next, also, psychosocial support, I think we talked about this, and vulnerability. Social work are closely supervised and monitor the needs of those most vulnerable during emergency situations. I think, as we know, that who are mentally frail, physically challenged, and women and children, particularly. Communities' participation and active involvement in disaster relief and management, you know, because they're the catalyst for resource mobilization. Social workers are familiar with assets for the resources that we need to mobilize. That's also an area that social workers can play a wonderful role, a strong role. And the last but not the least, it's about, you know, we know that one-to-one -one we can do a lot of provide services, but it needs more than that. The policy, some of you mentioned that, you know, policy needs to change, you know, and I think social workers, the unique thing is that we are well trained in both macro and micro sites. So well, social worker knowledge and the skill can be utilized in this area as well. So to me, as I mentioned that, it's not one party's response, it's a response that needs to be involved everyone from social service agency, mental health, Vertical society, non-governmental agency, civil society, governmental agencies, and of course with UN agencies. In Pakistan case, what we have learned, INGOs play a wonderful role, and you know, and also local civil society. So that's what I thought I was going to share. I could go more in depth if I would have time, you know. So I think thank you so much for your questions, and I will take. Should we take questions now? Thank you. I'm extremely delighted to introduce our next and final speaker for today's Disaster Forum, Dr. Mali Wong, who will speak on social sustainability, child trauma, and global climate change, a new challenge for social work. Dr. Mali Wong is a Senior Associate Dean and Clinical Professor and serves as Director of Field Education at the USC's Susan Dwarak Peck School of Social Work. She's an internationally recognized mental health expert called one of the preeminent experts in school crisis and recovery by the White House and the architect of school safety programs by the Wall Street Journal. Dr. Wong has developed mental health recovery programs, crisis and disaster training for school districts and law enforcement in the United States, Canada, Israel, and Asia. Her awards include the first Los Angeles County Mental Health Commission's Personal Legacy Award for national and international work on behalf of Children's Mental Health, and a Caregivers Program Award from Johnson & Johnson and the Roslyn Carter Institute for Human Development. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Marlene Wong to the stage. Dr. Wong. for being here this afternoon and for joining us in this presentation. I just want to thank uh, Dr. Moth, boy, that was a wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, set of information that you provided to us. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about the grand challenge uh, for social work. Those of you who are in schools of social work know there are 12 uh, grand challenges. And Do <laughs> what? Okay. Okay. No, okay. I'll try it again. Try it again. Yes. Here we go. All right. So this is one of the grand challenges. If you go um, onto the website or even put in social work grand challenges, it will all come up. Um, 
And this is the one that I've been working on with uh, Dr. Larry Palenkis, who uh, really is the first author of, of this paper, and it's a fabulous paper. Please do read it. It will give you all of the sites, uh, the citations, etc. But the whole point of it is that we know that there are going to be a great many environmental changes, including climate change. And originally, when Larry and I discussed this, we were going to focus on climate change until people started saying, you know, there are a lot of environmental changes, like the degradation of neighborhoods, uh, changing within urban centers, um, movement of people for all sorts of reasons. And so we uh, broadened it to, to be called uh, creating social responses to a changing environment. But today, um, I really want to talk more about climate change and its impact on uh, populations. And as you can see here, this is a report actually from one of the uh, commissions from the UN talking about data that has been collected and um, about you know how we need to look at what's going on around the world. So first of all, uh, they call everything that has water in it precipitation events. So whether it's you know hurricanes, cyclones, typhoons, etc., that there are going to be not only more of them, but they're going to be more intense. Uh, here's a, a uh, you know a uh, quote from a child care worker from Tacloban in the Republic of the Philippines. And there, the Philippines, I think, it's one of the most intensively affected areas. And they don't need to be convinced that there's climate change. They will tell you that it starts earlier in the season, it goes later in the season, and it's much, much more destructive than it has been in the past. Here's a, a quote from a child, and this is what we deal with. Uh, this is after Hurricane Katrina, and it relates to also one of the topics that I'm to speak about, and that's child trauma. So here's Kiyoka, who ended up in Los Angeles, and she told us her story while she was in New Orleans. And she said, while walking, we saw people crying because they had no food and water. We saw bodies in the street. They had an old man dead in a chair. I was so scared I thought I was going to die. We were walking on the bridge and the army men started to shoot in the air and I just started to cry. I was so scared. It started to rain and everybody started to cry saying, I hope another hurricane don't pass by. So is this the US or could it be anywhere else in the world? Something happened to a developing nation where we had an experience where everything failed, everything. Uh, I happened to help out in that, um, after that hurricane, I, I worked often with the Department of Education. Actually, my whole area of expertise is, is disasters and school shootings and uh, terrible events that affect school districts. And I was here after, immediately after 9-11, um, but working with the Board of Education schools. And I just want to say that, you know, social workers also, what I love about social work is we're often behind the scenes and that we always work with a team. We never work alone. So whatever system we're in, we're always working with other people. And I think that's the power of social work is that we're not, we're not there to impose any particular idea or approach, but there to assess, to help assess, to help identify gaps and then hopefully to work towards uh, filling those gaps. So Kyoka here um, is, it talked, is really sort of uh, a young child who, who is, has been traumatized. And um, I just want to point out, if we look at this through a trauma lens, you see here that um, the first thing was she was so scared she thought she was going to die. And that's really one of the key <coughs> symptoms of, that, of child trauma is that it's not whether we think our assessment of whether she thought she was going to die. It's her own experience that she was in a situation in which there was life threat. And also that, um, that she came to Los Angeles a couple of months afterwards. These, this general anxiety about something that was going to happen was still with her. And she carried it with her all the way from New Orleans into a new situation, and it did not subside. I mean, rain. Fortunately, she was in like one of the driest cities in the world because uh, uh, you know we, we, we can't handle rain. Uh, but still, when it would rain, she was very concerned that, that, that this event might happen again. 
Um, so what is childhood trauma? There are people here in this audience who are greater experts than I. And so I just want to provide a very, you know, kind of brief um, uh, discussion of it because um, I'm not, I'm, I'm a researcher in a particular area, which I'll talk about later, but I'm not a researcher in terms of disaster or in, um, in terms of, of other kinds of things that have been discussed today. But it is uh, a very overwhelming experience. It's a frightening, threatening, life-threatening experience, and it's overwhelming uh, and affects a child's ability to cope. So um, you all who are in schools of social work can go into much more detail, so I'm going to move on about that. And we know that there are various kinds of trauma, that it can be a one-time experience for a child, uh, that there, it could, a, a child could have actually chronic experiences that involve you know, repeated kinds of neglect or um, uh, exposure to um, violence or, or traumatic events, or it can be complex starting very early on in a child's development and continuing on uh, throughout their lives. I'm actually a subject matter expert on a lawsuit that's been filed in federal court. Uh, those are to get more information. Uh, Compton Unified School District, you can put that into Google. And uh, it is, uh, uh, the plaintiffs are students and teachers, uh, students who have experienced complex trauma and suing the school district at the federal level because they have not created a trauma-informed school. And I don't want to go more into it, but please do look at it because the student statements are quite, quite moving. Uh, oh, I, Compton, C-O-M-P-T-O-N, lawsuit. Just put that in and it will come up. It, but it was filed in federal court in May 2015. And we're still, um, if you can imagine, in its early stages. So we know that, um, that trauma affects children in many ways. And uh, these are some of the uh, symptoms and ways in which uh, they uh, are affected, and you can see that there's uh, impaired cognition and alt you know altered behavioral uh, control and evidence, etc. But also very much uh, attachment is affected, uh, mood regulation, and there are, it, it's a full body experience. It's not just an emotional or psychological or neurological. It's a it's a full body uh, reaction, and stress hormones do surge through every cell in the body, bathing every cell in the body which in itself makes it something difficult to uh, you know, predict how a child is going to react and why the symptoms change over time or they, they can be dissociative at one time or, and then highly reactive at another time. So brain researchers, this is from Dr. Bruce Perry who's my fellow subject matter expert. Bruce does a lot of uh, uh, you know, brain imaging and uh, he, he really does talk very, very eloquently about the areas of the brain that, are, uh, that get activated after a uh, experience with violence, an uh, experience with trauma, and how two parts of the brain cannot operate at one time. And that is that if a child is in a traumatic reaction, uh, the frontal cortex that really takes in new information and is able to synthesize, synthesize things or even to control behavior and modulate emotion, are those that part of the brain is not uh, in operation or in control. We uh, uh, here's where our uh, research com comes in. I've been in a 20-year research partnership with Rand Health. Some of you may know Rand. It's a think tank uh, headquarters in Santa Monica, but Rand offices all around the country. And previously, our um, you know we looked at violence exposure in. Um, Los Angeles Unified School District in, um, to see whether or not, first of all, what was the prevalence of violence exposure in specific areas, uh, zip codes with high poverty and crime, and then across the rest of the school district, which is 700 square miles long. It's the second largest school district in the country, the first being right here in uh, New York City. But uh, our fellow researchers really made the um, argument for the effects of, of violence, exposure, and trauma on children as it relates to their education, which of course is sort of the main job of being a kid. You know, learning to get along with other people, but also being able to be educated uh, so that you can prepare yourself for 
adulthood. Um, all of these things, uh, 8% to 92% of kids endorsed that uh, question and said yes. Um, and then of those children, we went back and we did a um, clinical survey and fully 27% of the children who had had multiple exposures had full-on PTSD at very high levels and an additional 16% of those children had um, clinical levels of childhood depression. So um, again, Bruce says, you know, the brain just changes. If you're in the midst of your experience with violence and, um, you know, in the months afterwards, if in fact you are traumatized, that um, these are the things that impair education and also relationships within uh, the family as well as in schools. And to get back to the whole idea of disasters and, and um, is, is Larry and I uh, were in the, in the paper, uh, Larry in particular, not Larry and me, because I, I just want you to know he's the primary guy on this thing, is um, that the, the average temperature in the world will rise uh, for in the, within these ranges. And what happens is also the sea levels rise. But the important part of the sea level is that it literally wipes out a lot of places on Earth that are already being inundated with these precipitation events. Um, and here, Mother Superior, we were, we were in, um, in um, Tacloban, we were in uh, the Philippines in, in 2013. And, and the first thing we do is to talk with the people who are who have suffered from these events. And Mother Superior, the Catholic Church, was very involved in response and recovery. And she said there was no one to call them. There was no warning system. She looked out on the ocean, and she said, we have to leave. Then, you know, conversely, there are places in the world going through terrible drought. And what happens between the two of these things is that the, there's a significant decline in the pH levels, which means there's going to be uh, lowered food sources for a lot of folks that live along the shorelines and for areas of the country that depend upon uh, marine life for food. It's also very fascinating that this UN report indicates that climate refugees now outnumber those refugees fleeing from conflict zones. That's a pretty startling um, conclusion for them. But it is, for social work then, and climate, climate change, environmental change is an issue of social justice. It does affect more greatly these very at-risk populations, women, children, older adults in the last typhoon that swept um, the Philippines. 60% of the people over 60 were swept away by storm surges, and the import of that is that there is no formal child welfare system. It is the family and the extended family that cares for generations of children. So if you wipe out the 60% of the, of the senior folks, you've got now no more people to help take care of the children. And in the last typhoon, these storm surges that crisscrossed across these long peninsulas uh, often uh, swept away both parents uh, and older folks and left the children alone. So we have social work challenges, and rather than read the words, I just want to go through them like the great pictures that Dr. Mathbor had. Uh, this is from Ken Wells. Some of you know Ken. He's a researcher at UCLA. Um, he has ran an NIMH center there for partnered research. And um, he talks about the challenges of natural disasters, and, and I think that these are areas which are, can greatly, are, that where social workers could contribute a great deal. One is the whole idea of disrupted communities and um, all the social and communication structures. And what we learned uh, in particular after uh, New Orleans is that, and, and especially in surrounding rural areas, is when the FEMA tents and, and temporary housing came in, if things were just thrown down at random by the people who came in, weren't part of that community, they just threw them down, those communities actually had a much harder time recovering. But if they talked to the people who lived in the communities and attempted to re, sort of reconstruct them in areas where, you know, here's where the school was, 
right? Here's where the mayor's office was, and here's where most people live. They actually did much better because I don't know if you want to call it muscle memory, but they were they they were able to really recover much more quickly and more effectively by having people talk with them about how their community literally was organized. There are diminished uh, coping resources and social supports here uh, in the China aftermath of this uh, Wenchuan earthquake in 2008 in China. Um, the, these, these individuals were in very remote villages and, and the devastation was everything was gone. Everything, every building. Uh, the households, uh, there wasn't anything to be uh, recuperated, I mean to, to, to be, you know, gotten from these structures and here, um, this is a father whose child is buried under that rubble. Because as you will remember, it was a great, great outcry, uh, that the, a, a scandal that schools had been built very cheaply and that the rebar, which I saw, was like this thick for multiple level buildings. And what happened is that whole schools of children were buried and, and were under the rubble for many, many uh, weeks and months. The challenges, there are also new problems that come about. So here are people literally walking over the sides of mountains because in the aftermath of the Wenchuan earthquake, there was also terrible rain that followed, flooding, uh, mountains that sort of like started crashing down. And I was caught up in this. This was the first time I was ever in a disaster where I thought, I don't know if I'm gonna get back. Because the road on which we, we, we drove for many hours, some fellow, uh, Chinese fellow, with um, a, a U.S. Marine shirt on, uh, drove us in, in a van that looked like an American van but had absolutely like no seat belts. I mean, I, 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 that already was like very disturbing. But then we got into this, these villages and the roads collapsed and, and they said, get out of the van. And, and we said, what for? And they said, you've got you've to move these rocks out of the way, otherwise you won't get back. It's like, oh my God, you've asked the wrong woman to move rocks out of her room. <laughs> um, I did it, I did it. <laughs> Surprising what you can do. Okay, so preparing for the next wave, in, in some of these different areas where I've been, both in remote areas, as well as working in Japan uh, and the Philippines, is that schools really are the first institutions, our anchor institutions to, to uh, come back. And they'll just put up a tent and say, this is a school. And somehow that very establishment of that institution makes all the difference. So um, I, I'm, you know, I was director of mental health for LA Unified School District for many years, head of the crisis teams, suicide preventions. And so this is really an editorial. I mean, you can ignore it if you want to, but I'm just so convinced that money need, from disaster planning needs to go to schools. Because that's where they know people, that's who they trust. Um, it, there's not much stick, there's no stigma to going to say to a teacher, I need help, this is what's going on in my life. Okay, because this is a place where children can go to, to be safe. Let's, um, here's, here's a, and some of you, many, many of you in New York know about this. This was actually, I'm proud to say, something that I recommended on the 10 days after 9-11. I was sitting with the chancellor of the board of the New York schools at that time. And I said, you know what, this is happening. You really need to do a study. Because all of America needs to know. I mean, we're, we're in a war on terrorism now. What is the impact of this particular event? It's, um, you can see here uh, that if we want to talk about PTSD, we know that the first um, criteria is that you have to have a direct experience with a violent event. It can't be something you see in a movie. You know, it's not something that's necessary. Well, there might be sort of genetic factors, but but uh, but you do have to have that firsthand direct experience. And so the preliminary report it was done at, at Columbia, and um, and I just wanted to share it with you as a reminder. Uh, because um, this, after 9-11, these were the rates of um, mental health challenges that they found among the children. And of course, uh, they, what they decided to do also is that they would um, survey each of the uh, boroughs 
uh, with the same number of children because the impact was across the boroughs. The ch many children lost parents and loved ones and friends and family. But um, the bottom line is that their PTSD did represent a certain percentage, which was about 10%. But you can see here that most of these are generalized anxi or anxiety disorders. But you also see what we might consider conduct disorders, and that is very much a question about whether or not it could be part of a PTSD um, uh, you know, symptomatology. But in any event, after, a, uh, after an act of terrorism, the need based on this particular study uh, was 26.5% would be children who really did need the intervention of a mental health or someone in the schools, like a social worker. <laughs> so uh, going back to our research, uh, one, uh, one thing that you could be saying, you could ask about is, well, you know, does this other, does this, what was the baseline for New York City? I mean, is there a, is there a baseline for be, living in New York City? And I don't think we know that, because here's our baseline in South LA. <laughs> 88 to 92 percent of the children in South Los Angeles have PTSD. If you're 11 years old, I'm out on the street, um, and that um, when we did these studies um, of, of children and their parents, and we did do, um, I'm going to just show you some pictures of. We did develop two evidence-based practices. One is called cognitive behavioral intervention for trauma in schools, which is CBITS. And the other is support to students exposed to trauma, which is the teacher version of CBITS. Because so many school districts said, across the country, we don't have social workers, clinical social workers, we, we're just as teachers. And, um, and the reason we did that is because when we did our first round of, uh, you know, in CBITS, we have a, a portion that is a parent education section we work with parents. And in our first few cohorts of, um, implementing our intervention, 76 of the parents said, there's someone else in my family who has the same thing. I don't, I, now I have a name for it, but they're suffering from it. So here's a little picture of CBIS. Um, we didn't know anything, we're so naive. Like, you know, some publishing company said they, that they would be willing to publish this, so we said, okay. Now it's owned by the publishing company. We never asked for anything, we never, not good. Um, don't do that. So now people, including us, have to pay $60 to get the see if it's manual. We got smarter. We said, you know what, we'll just put it on a website because we want it to be in the public domain. So if you go to RAND.org, which is the RAND website, you just, you know, find support to students exposed to trauma. It's a 10 session teaching kind of lesson plan for teachers. And um, you know, put some paper in your printer, hit the print button, go out for dinner, and when you come back, you'll have the whole manual for free. Um, oh, this is this is very relevant. So, um, you know, TFCBT. I know some of you and and CBITS, and they're both evidence-based practices. Uh, my impression of, of TFCBT is as much is for much more serious kinds of situations. Uh, children who have suffered from sexual abuse or chronic um, neglect and abuse. Um, I, I find CBITS a more early intervention kind of approach, although it does uh, uh, you know, address many symptoms of PT, childhood PTSD. And so after our randomized clinical trials, we, we place it solidly with early interventions and intermediate interventions with TFCBT being at the higher end. So we, we, we actually uh, collaborated with Judy Cohen and Tony Manorino and Lisa Jaycox, is, uh, she was also first, the three of them shared authorship on this one. But we decided um, we want to see how this works post-Katrina. And uh, so 120 students were put into two groups, 60 in each. Um, and one group was in schools, CBITS, it was created for schools in schools and then CFTBC, uh, CFTBC. Um, when I get nervous, I speak Chinglish. Sorry, so I get it. Um, so um, 50, so you can see here the outcomes of them, which is access trumps effectiveness. You know, they're both effective. 
But 54, per, uh, 54 of the 60 students in the schools completed all CBITs, all 10 CBITs uh, sessions. But only four of the 60 students referred to a clinic right there in this little community, not far away. Only four completed TFCBT. And that's not because it wasn't effective, but it's about access, and access is in the schools. Also, access um, uh, addresses disparities issues because, you know, all of the children in that community were able to access CBITs, regardless of what, you know, we, we see these disparities in treatment, etc. But if children get it in schools, then all the children in the school can receive the same level of services. So why education? Again, ignore my whole editorial, but it's about, you know, the Declaration of Human Rights includes education. And um, you can see here, each of these conventions, these world forums, um, have talked about how children deserve education and care in education. But I would also to point out for those of us who live in the US that the National Commission on Children and Disasters do have recommendations about schools. Oh, this is more of the editorial. I'm sorry. I'll just keep on going, you know, because you'll get it. You'll get copies of the PowerPoint. So but let me go into here. The recommendation from the, this, this was a presidential commission. Uh, Barack Obama, uh, you know, endorsed the people who served on the commission. But one of the recommendations was that, that at that time we weren't sufficiently, this was in 2010, we weren't sufficiently incorporating education and education systems into the national disaster plan. So more and more you see every year that education and schools are gonna be incorporated into it. Um, to provide immediate resources to schools, and what they mean by that is FEMA crisis counseling. That schools deserve to have FEMA crisis counseling go directly to the school district so that they can use it in the way they need to, to provide those services in the schools. Uh, to train local school personnel with skills and knowledge because they are the first responders and they will be the first responders until the children leave the school. They're, they'll be there, they're there before, they'll be there during and they'll be there after. And um, we can train people with new knowledge and skills that relate to disaster, no doubt. Former Congresswoman um, Maza, and this is in the Republic of the Philippines, uh, after we went there, said uh, this approach not only is about make, building sustainable partnerships and not just parachute relief, which I think is all of our objectives. Um, I just wanted to show you the process of building capacity in schools and the language before, during, and after is President Obama's language from the White House. He said, he asked the question, what does the school need to do before? Before a disaster even occurs. And that's all about training and preparedness. What should a school do during? And that is reaching out to gather children, reaching out to children, finding children, uh, bringing them to the schools, and, and having services be co-located at schools. The immediate response. And then, of course, recovery, which could take up to three years or more, and that schools are very much involved in the recovery efforts because of the impact that this trauma can have on a child's learning. Also, this is from a this is from a um, colleague who has since died, um, and we worked together at, after Columbine. Uh, we stayed in contact with each other. And, uh, uh, she used to put this at the end of all of her emails after the shooting in Columbine uh, to remind people that to the world you may be just one person, but to one person you just may be the world. And I think it's so apt with, in relation to disaster response and recovery because it's not those of us who are going to helicopter in, and there is a role for people to come in uh, to help convene um, different groups of folks and to add thoughts that are not affected by being victimized by being a victim of, of an ex having first-hand experience with the um, disaster or terrorist attack that's going on, is that every person on the ground, especially in schools, that you are, you, you are that person that a child can depend upon. You could mean the world to them in terms of how you interact and um, how you help them to recover. 
so thank you very much. I, I, and she gave me the sign that said five minutes. And what I really like about this whole thing is that people like you a lot better if you end early. So thank you very much. <laughs>